Congressman Charlie Gonzalez, welcome to the program. Hey, thank you for having me. Thank you, sir. Uh, Congressman, as the chairman of the House Hispanic Caucus and a uh, supporter of the president, how do you evaluate the state of the presidential election today? Well, you know, this far out from November, yeah, I've been in politics. My father was in politics all his life, and, and I've been for most of mine. Uh, things can change at, at any moment, and I think everyone recognizes that. But I would say that the president is in an excellent position. The Republicans are just coming off what has been a, a rather uh, brutal primary, uh, which has caused uh, Governor Romney to basically lean so far over to the right that it has placed him, in my, in my opinion, uh, in great jeopardy in being a credible candidate for the next few months without him having to walk back from some of the positions that he's taken. So I, I think he's actually going to be playing some defense where usually it's the incumbent that plays defense and the challenger on the offense. And, and Congressman, um, to, to that point of, of things that were said in the primary, uh, and you've been in politics, and as you said, you're your father for a long time, in the age of the Internet, YouTube, and so forth, can you really walk back certain comments? Like, for example, Governor Romney's uh, suggestion that the Arizona anti-immigrant law should be the model for the United States? Uh, in, in today's <laughs> electronic world, you can't walk away from anything. It's there forever. I mean, that's one of the issues, as you already know, uh, as younger people are introduced into the technology and such, is to be very careful. It seems like uh, things in media today and in, in cyberspace uh, have an eternal lifespan. Mm -hmm. So, no, I, I think what happens is that what you do is you say one thing, and then later you say another, but what you previously said has been recorded in some form. Right. And usually, I mean, it's just out there. And it, it's very hard because what you do then is, you know, you do the old split screen and you mm -hmm. have someone saying two different things. Right. And, and so uh, as you look at uh, not only uh, Mr. Romney's comments uh, regarding immigration, but uh, really other issues as well um, uh, relative to some uh, women issues and, and Planned Parenthood and so forth, um, do you think these will be critical um, points of differentiation between the Democrats and the Republicans, not just in the presidential campaign, but also as you look uh, at the House races and the Senate? Oh, absolutely. Uh, because what you're going to see is on the Democratic side, from the president on down, is if you look at our agenda, uh, it's going to be one that is going to be much more fair to the American people than what the future would look like with a President Romney. There is no doubt. Uh, for minorities, it, it's so clear that I don't think you're going to be able to even argue the point, even though I know that Governor Romney and some of his allies will be going to the uh, Hispanic community in an attempt to, to do some damage control. They'll have to do that with women, too. Uh, it, it's just not minorities, and it's just not women, but it's working families. Uh, if you look at their economic plan, that it really doesn't help the working families to educate their children, to obtain affordable, quality health care, and on and on. So I do believe that you're going to be able to make a very clear distinction as to the vision that President Obama and the Democrats have for this country and that of Governor Romney. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, let me ask you about that. The uh, Ryan, so-called Ryan budget, uh, I know the Democrats are rebranding at the Romney-Ryan budget. Uh, this is a, um, a political uh, budget more than an actual governing budget that was uh, passed on a party line vote pretty much in, in, in the House. Now, part of it uh, counts on cuts to Medicaid, which, of course, uh, impact uh, low-income uh, Americans disproportionately, uh, while uh, lowering, as I read the analysis, lowering uh, taxes for the wealthiest Americans. Uh, Mr. Romney has em uh, embraced it. It's become a uh, sort of a Republican um, a totem almost. Uh, everyone who's against it sort of gets ostracized. Everyone who's for it is embraced. Um, from your perspective, uh, why is this budget not the appropriate way to look at uh, um, the finances of our government? Uh, can we really afford not to do some of these cuts that Mr. Ryan is articulating in this budget? Well, that's the problem, uh, you know, with Congressman Ryan's plan. And, you know, Congressman Ryan and I came into Congress at the same time. So, I, I, you know, I know him. Mm -hmm. and, and he's a very smart and capable individual. It's just that his... Uh, economic policies would spell disaster for the average 
American family, and it's it, what you're pointing out. Many people view uh, the federal government's role in a different light. Democrats seem to think that the federal government does have a legitimate role when it comes to health care, when it, it comes to income security, when it comes to education, and so on. Because no one else is really going to make that investment to the extent that the federal government can and should. What the Ryan plan does, it basically hits all of the different programs in order to reduce deficits and the, and the national debt. But they do it truly on the backs of the average working family while still providing and extending or expanding favorable tax treatment for the very wealthiest Americans. It's not a question of class warfare. It is not a, a question of uh, begrudging uh, someone's uh, financial success. We all want to be financially successful. The problem with that is, as long as you do it without ex exacting great cost, or sacrifice to the majority of your fellow Americans. And that's what the Ryan Plan does. And so it doesn't invest in America. It doesn't invest in its people. And it does not provide an adequate safety net for those that obviously are no longer in the workforce and seniors or retired and depending on, on Medicare, or those that would qualify for Medicaid because their income doesn't allow them to go to the doctor. So it, it's just not there, but we're, we're going to be looking at education also. So the Ryan plan, again, I mean, this is the second budget he's proposed. Yeah, to me, it's just as bad as the one that was voted on a year ago. And as careful analysis is made of the budget, I think we'll come to that conclusion. Now, but Mr. Chairman, so when, the, when Representative Ryan gets up and he's done a couple of YouTube videos and so forth, and he says that his plan will save Medicare and Medicaid, is this just factually not true? Is it sophistry? Is it uh, just uh, rhetoric? Or, or what, what are we missing here? There are two, uh, obviously, two very different interpretations of what seems to be the same math. Well, his definition of saving is to make it into a different program. Now, if, if that's uh, one's view of saving a program, I guess you could say uh, that you're saving it, but you're not. You're transforming it. You're transforming it into a voucher system, even though he's going to tell you that you'll have a choice. You can stay with traditional Medi Medicare or you can go with a voucher system. Anybody that's analyzed this will tell you that that is not plausible. It, you can't do that. You won't be able to split it up that way. The voucher part of it, even with its calculation, with the increases that will be pegged to some increase in the GDP, mm -hmm. is exceeded by the increase in medical costs per year, which means you are falling further and further behind with each passing year as to what medical care will cost you, but your voucher will almost remain stagnant. While the increased cost of medical care goes through the roof, you will not be able to pay for medical, uh, medical care. And again, every analysis shows that the voucher system that uh, Congressman Ryan is proposing will not keep up with medical costs, which means medical care will not be available. Uh, I will say this. Yes, you need to be looking at, in Congress we call it bending the, the medical care cost. Right. We need to be reducing the cost of health care. As a matter of fact, the Affordable Care Act, which is referred to affectionately by the Republicans as Obamacare, right. actually starts that process. But you never hear that part of the debate because it's been drowned out by the negative publicity. And, and um, switching gears a little bit, Mr. Chairman, uh, you serve on the Energy Committee. Obviously, um, we have seen some uh, jumps in energy prices, gasoline and so forth, for a variety of reasons, uh, greater demand in Asia, but uh, probably principally at this point because of instability in the Middle East. Um, what do you think is the, uh, and to the extent anybody can predict these things, uh, what do you think is going to be the evolution of gasoline prices over the next six months or so, and what will be the impact, if any, uh, as far as you can tell, looking forward uh, in the election, to the election? Well, in my opinion, uh, you know, if you look at the cost of oil and, and the tremendous investors that buy the oil but don't really use it, um, they're really uh, capital venture uh, groups and such. That adds some of the volatility, and, and the problem to it all is that it's it's an international market. It's a global market. The, the
price of a barrel is not set in, in the United States, unfortunately. It just doesn't work that way. But looking forward, there's only so much that the government, whether it's the president or the United States Congress, is really going to be able to do with some of that market manipulation or the international situation that does impact the cost of a barrel of oil. Where we have lost our way, Bernardo, is that at one time we knew that greater efficiency and going into alternative uh, fuels was truly the answer. Now we're falling behind on that, and we shouldn't have. We still need to increase domestic production, which the president recognizes, but the traditional fuels should be viewed as transitional fuels into something that doesn't make us dependent on really any source of, of uh, fossil fuel. And in this case, it, it would be oil. I'm not talking about mm -hmm. natural gas. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the United States, to be very honest with you, and the president has been brutally honest, that people don't want to hear that you're not going to bring gasoline down to $2 a gallon like Newt Gingrich promised, right. or Romney is hinting that he would be able to bring the price down. What people forget, that even during the Bush administration, that in June and July of 2008, at the end of President Bush's uh, term, last second term, gas prices went over $4 a gallon. And he really wasn't able to do anything about it because guess what? It was a global market, international forces, and speculators. Now, we've tried to do something about the speculators, but I think we've been inadequate in addressing it. And there's nothing you do about, uh, many times about the international. But you can do about, uh, much about how you consume or what you consume here in the United States. So I think the president is being realistic about saying, look, we need greater domestic production so that we're not dependent on foreign sources, but that's only half of the equation. The other part of the equation is not to have the dependency on fossil fuel, gasoline, uh, of course, based on crude, as your cheap and primary source of, of fuel. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, and, and we've gotten away from that. Now, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, switching uh, and uh, coming to an end to uh, our time together this afternoon, uh, to the purely political, uh, the House, uh, of course, flipped in uh, 2010. Uh, there are uh, 25 seats that uh, Democrats would have to capture in order to regain the majority. Uh, what are your prospects? Well, we actually believe we're in, in pretty good shape. Uh, we're working it really hard. Uh, by and you're exactly right. We need 25 seats in the House to retake uh, the majority. Uh, there are about 75 seats that are truly in play. We have over about 64 seats that are occupied by Republicans in districts in which President Obama carried back in 2008. And if we put the same amount of energy uh, that we did four years ago, there's an excellent chance that we can take back some of, or most of those seats. So I think the 25 is quite doable. Okay, well, um, unfortunately we're out of time, but uh, Congressman Charlie Gonzalez, Chairman of the House Hispanic Caucus, thank you for joining us today. Oh, it has been my pleasure. My pleasure, sir, and I hope you'll come back. You bet. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.